Imperator Caesar Traianus Adrianus Augustus. For short, we know him as Emperor Hadrian. Rising to the position of Emperor in 117 AD after the Great Trajan, Hadrian inherited an empire that was at the cusp of a golden age. Trajan had crushed its main op opponents, acquired enormous amounts of loot that gave the economy an important boost and expanded its borders to the largest they would ever be. Hadrian had quite a daunting task, to be a good emperor after what many considered to have been the very best they had so far. But he was a man of different temperament, different values, and a different way of seeing the management of this enormous superstate. While Trajan was an expansionist, always thinking about the next push on the frontiers, Hadrian thought the empire had expanded enough, as he was much more worried about fully Romanizing, defending, and interconnecting the territories already under his control. Another key difference between Trajan and Hadrian had to do with the way each one tackled the issue of decision-making. Trajan had an eye for talent, handing over everyday management of provinces to local elites that understood the peculiarities of their region. Hadrian, however, was a micromanager. He wanted to know as much as possible about every little aspect of the empire and decide personally on as many things as possible. Nowadays, Hadrian would likely be the world's most annoying boss. The type of guy that always shows up behind your desk asking what you're working on. With the added point that he was the emperor, so if he considered that your little report was not adequate, he would have you thrown to the lions at the Colosseum. Since he could not do that, he did what the technology of the time allowed him to do. He mounted on a horse or a boat with his imperial entourage and for years he toured around the empire, from border frontier to safe interior frontier, visiting as many places as possible and managing the empire personally. And wherever he went, he erected monuments and buildings, fixed existing ones, raised ceremonial plates. Lots of historians give Hadrian two main titles, the Traveler and the Architect. But today, we're not here to look at the buildings he raised, although that would deserve an episode, but to his amazing travels around the empire. A series of coins was issued in commemoration of each province he visited, featuring the person personified image of cities, landmarks, events, and even entire provinces. It is a vast series of coins, and we don't have all of them here, but we have enough pieces to look at today so we will get a very comprehensive look at what we call the travel series of the Nadi. But before we hop on the reverse of these coins, where the travel series is, I want to call your attention to this really interesting quirk of Hadrian's obverses, so the portraits. Hadrian loved everything Greek and believed the ideal leader would be the so-called philosopher king, a man with the best attributes of civilized life who was supposed to always think about the very best things for his people. Hadrian depicted himself as this philosopher, first by breaking the tradition of the clean-shaven emperors and being depicted with a beard. Not a massive philosopher's beard, that will show up later with Marcus Aurelius, but a trimmed one, a middle point, as to not shock the establishment with such a radical change in imagery. He also drops the laurel wreath a typical sign of the emperor in many of his coin designs, opting for a bare-headed bust, which was only commonly used all the way back in the early reigns of Augustus, the first emperor. This gives the coinage of Hadrian a lot of variety and a breath of fresh air. As you can see on your screen now, we have an example of a bare-headed bust. His reign also shows very consistent and very well-accomplished style. His coins are really very well-made. In this other example, however, we have a more traditional style, now with the laurel, wreath, the laurel wreath in his head. All right, let's get started into the travel series itself. And we kick things off back home, back in Italy. The starting point of all of his travels had to be the imperial capital, Rome, and the entire province of Italy had a design commemorating it. 
Here we can see Italia holding a scepter, symbolizing she was the ruling province over all of the empire, and a cornucopia, the symbol of abundance. Housing the capital of the empire obviously meant this province was by far the richest. So let's look at coins of his first journey. During his first tour, attributed to the years 121 to 125, he goes from the northern borders of Britain to the frontiers of Germany, all the way to Spain, and then all the way to the Far East, to Syria. The first coin of this voyage that we're, we have here is that of Germania, an incredible contrast if we compare it to the peaceful Italy we've just seen. The province was heavily militarized, and it shows. Look at her spear and the shield she's holding. The shape of the shield is also different to the Roman scutum. This is a Germanic shield, used by the barbarians beyond the frontier, and must have been a feared sight for the legionaries at the frontier. After inspecting the Rhine legions in the far north of Britannia, Hadrian headed south to his home province of Hispania. Just like Trajan, he was of provincial origins from the city of Italica, where he erected a massive amphitheater, half the size of the Colosseum. The province of Hispania was very peaceful during the second century, quite far away from the frontier and had a very pleasant weather compared to the northern regions. The Denarius celebrating it shows the difference. We can see such a relaxed design. So as we can see, we have a very relaxed and outgoing goddess. She's just relaxing, laying down. She's resting her head over a representation of the Pyrenees on the northeastern part of Spain. She brandishes an olive branch, as this province was the main producer of olive oil for the empire, and by her feet, in many versions of this reverse, she has a charming little rabbit. The region had so many rabbits that one of the administrative regions in the area was called by the Romans Terra Conensis, literally meaning land with lots of rabbits. From Hispania, he crossed the whole Mediterranean by boat, arriving at Antioch and heading over to Asia, where he met Antinos, the true love of his life. He became so attached to the young man that he even had some coins struck on his name, despite him not having any imperial titles. As for the province of Asia itself, it was a very prominent part of the empire, it was very rich, it housed many of the great cities of the classical Greek world, and Hadrian, being such a Greekophile, must really have enjoyed his visits there. The depiction of Asia shows a goddess stepping over the prow of a boat, certainly showing the commercial nature of the region. She holds in one hand an oar, and that hook-like element on her other hand is an acrostolium, a charm put on the very tip of a ship's prow to protect it against evil spirits. We then head to the year 128, when Hadrian went on a shorter trip, he visited southern Italy and the province of Africa. We have once more a reclined goddess, and wow, there's so much going on in this design. Africa was seen as this exotic, distant place, and its incarnation, its representation really passes this message. She's half naked, reclined over a barrel of wheat, as the region was a major grain producing region. She wears an elephant headdress, which might have sent chills down the spine of every Roman historian, reminding them of the African elephants used by Hannibal against the Roman Republic centuries before. Africa also holds on her hand a scorpion, another symbol that references to an exotic, distant, unknown land. We then look at Hadrian's voyage to Egypt in 130. For this province, we have the curious issue of three different designs. One for Egypt itself, one for the capital, the city of Alexandria, and another one dedicated to the river Nilus itself. We start with the denarius celebrating Egypt, as we can read here, Aegyptos. Once more we have the deity laying down. Egypt was a fertile land, so next to the goddess of Egypt we can see a barrel full of fruits and grain, and by her feet we see an ibis, a bird common to the region, a distant cousin of the flamingo. She's also holding a sistrum, a percussion instrument common to the region. It would make a sound similar to a rattle. The main feature of Egypt, obviously, was the mighty Nile River. The incarnation of the river, the god Milus, is commonly depicted on Egyptian coins, as we can see here. 
we have a male god reclined over the waters of the river, holding a cornucopia, the sign of the riches brought by its waters. It's interesting to see how Nihilus is depicted. In some instances, it is shown as a chubby, almost fat god, as a way of showing the unusual abundance of food that the region produced. In the case of this coin, however, Nihilus has Nihilus has been to the gym. He has some serious buffed physique. We then look at Alexandria, the capital of Egypt, and the second largest city of the empire. At the height of the second century, it is theorized that it housed nearly half a million people, so it was a massive metropolis. Here in the scenarios, we see the incarnation of the city, holding once more the sistrum, that rattle. We have the legends, Alexandria, and on her other hand, a basket with a serpent. Hadrian might have loved to travel, but he was emperor after all, and he had a capital to take care of. Not necessarily making reference to a province itself, this last denarius of the day features the Adventus, or in Latin, Adventus, the ceremonial entrance of the emperor in a city. So every time he entered the city for the first time, they would have this fancy ceremony and they would call it Adventus. Most of the time, what is depicted is the arrival of the emperor to Rome itself. In the case of this piece, he's clasping hands with the incarnation of the city of Rome, Dea Roma, the goddess of the city. We can identify her by her typical helmet, her cape, and her spear. Hadrian had a, quite a long reign, 21 years and many consider his coinage as the pinnacle of Roman imperial quality on coinage. I wouldn't go so far, but it is pretty good. And the travel series is but one of the many interesting series of coins struck under this fascinating emperor. Do you have a coin of Hadrian? Let us know which one in the comment section down below. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Leave a like and consider subscribing if you did. Happy collecting, and I'll see you soon.